So we're continuing with our series called Crucial Conversations. My message today I've called The Heat Is On. Uh, Nikki and the worship team asked if for a closing they could sing The Heat Is On. I said, do you have it worked up? No, I didn't say that. Whether in our families or our marriages, our workplace, our friendships, and even in our church, conversations that go wrong have a profoundly negative impact in our lives. They can end up in loss of friendship, increased workplace stress, a feeling of disconnectedness. It can even lead in the right conversation. It can lead to divorce. Are, are you with me? Are you following me? Are you tracking with what I'm saying? If a conversation in your marriage goes the wrong way, it can end up in a very difficult situation. I came across a study this week that said arguing is the second most common reason at 56% for people to get divorced. Some of you say that's the best quality of my marriage. It's how we argue. We're good arguers. 85% of employees here in the U.S. say that they experience relational conflict at work. Those lead to conversations, don't they? Another survey found that 25% of churches experience conflict in the last two years that's so significant that somebody winds up leaving the church as a result of it. That's pretty significant. So crucial conversations that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. Let me give you a little bit more of an in-depth definition of crucial conversations. It's a discussion between two or more people where, number one, the stakes are high. Opinions vary. That's number two. And number three, emotions run strong. I found that in a book entitled Crucial Conversations where I stole the, 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 the title for our series. And I'll tell you what, I, th- I think it's right on the money. So today, the context behind uh, what we're going to talk about comes from Daniel chapter 3. And I want to talk about that context for just a minute because Daniel chapter 3 was written somewhere between 536 and 530 B.C. And probably the most well-known name on the face of the earth at that time was a man whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Try to spell that 25 times when you're writing your message. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, just, just phonetically you can sound it out. He was the king of Babylon, and, and he ruled for an incredible 40-year period of time. That's a long time. During his reign, the Babylonian Empire reached its absolute peak, its absolute zenith. The city of Babylon reached its greatest glory. And in 586 B.C., something interesting happened that intersects with our text He captured and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple there in Jerusalem. And he began the systematic deportation of many of the residents of Judah. Many of those who lived in the city of Jerusalem. Now, at some point after this, the king has a dream. Now... A bad dream is different for a king than it is for you and I. Occasionally, my wife will wake up and she will, or or sometime during the day, she will tell me about this terrible dream that she had last night, and I'm the star featured attraction in that dream. It's a bad dream, okay? It's not a good dream. And she will tell me some awful thing that I did in my dream. And I say, but honey, I'm, I'm right here. I don't feel that way. I, she's even, she told me, she said she even told her coworkers, and I know that's not really Kevin. I mean, this is a bad dream that really bothered her. 
And the worst part of it is two weeks later, she had some other bad dream, and I was in that one too. Well, the king has a bad dream, and he talks to his advisors. He talks to those that he has brought into his court to give him advice, to give him counsel. And they have many, many names. They're wise men, and he tells them, I had a dream, and I want you to interpret that dream for me. And so all of them lean forward. Because they want to hear the dream. Tell us the dream and we will interpret it for you. Doesn't that sound pretty normal? He said, oh no. If I tell you the dream, you can make up something that sounds good and I might believe you. So I'm not going to tell you what my dream is. You've got to tell me what my dream is. And then give me the interpretation. And oh, by the way, if you all are not able to do that, I'm going to go off with your heads. I want you to think, now that's a job that could be short-lived, okay? Very short-lived. So all of this goes on, and we know from reading the scriptures that a Hebrew named Daniel was found. They knew that he interpreted dreams. They said, Daniel, please, can you come bail us out? And, and Daniel seeks the Lord, and he said, okay, I'll talk to the king. And God gives him both the dream and the interpretation. And as a result of that, Daniel is made to be the ruler over the region where the capital city city of Babylon is and Daniel is able to appoint, appoint administrators and he appoints and this is not nepotism but he appoints three of his buddies Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and they are advisors they are people that are helping to rule their administrators in that area and that brings us to Daniel chapter 3, where King Nebuchadnezzar has a brilliant idea. And, and I want you to understand that at this time, there is no one on the face of the earth that is more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. He has the, the, the there, there's, it's, it, he, at that time in history, it's him. He's the guy and everybody knows it. So he has this incredible, brilliant idea. And he has this huge, and I believe it's 70 feet tall, this huge image that is made of gold. Now, they, the, the, you know, people kind of debate a little bit when you read the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the people that write on this stuff. And, and the scholars will say, you know, it, it probably was not solid gold. It probably had a wood frame. And it probably had layered gold all around it. And he had this huge, huge uh, image that was made. And he said, I got this great idea. I want to have everybody come and worship this image. Now, it's not uncommon for rulers during uh, world history to have uh, their, their, their worship ideas kind of mixed up, and sometimes um, they, will, they will set themselves up to be worshipped, and, and we don't read anything that says that the image was made to look like Nebuchadnezzar. We're not really sure, but whatever the case, they were to worship this image. So he gets together everyone from his government and he gives them some instructions and they understand that the music is going to play. And when the music plays, they are expected to bow down and worship. And so on that day at the given time, everyone is gathered and the music plays and everyone bows down in worship except for three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not told that Daniel is there, so I, I don't want you to think that Daniel is bowing and worship, worshiping the golden image. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are not worshiping. Everyone knows that government at the highest levels is cutthroat, and everybody wants to get ahead. And so there were a couple of guys like that 
They happened to be specifically called astrologers. Um, that They were some of the, the ones that would be giving uh, advice, giving counsel to, uh, to the king. And they happened to uh, be looking out of the corner of their eye and they saw that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not bowed. And so they went to the king and they said, Oh, oh great king, live forever. We want you to know that there's three guys that did not bow when, you, when the music played. If they didn't bow, we just thought you'd want to know. And so that really helps us to get to Daniel chapter 3. The king has uh, decided that the punishment, and this was beforehand, decided the punishment for not worshiping would be to be thrown alive into a blazing hot furnace, and that would be the way that they would be executed. Um, that's a great way to kind of cull out your leadership a little bit, you know, just to kind of pare it down, you know, <clears throat> have something where you could be throwing people into the fiery furnace. So let me, let me read from Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. <clears throat> Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, it, it may be true that he did not, not know uh, much about Hebrews because, um, th you know, th they've been already in exile. Um, he, he may not have known much about their, their form of worship. I, I don't think so because of Daniel, but it's possible. But, but he's saying, are, are you, do you guys not, you know, do you, do you guys not, is it true what I've heard? So then let's keep going. Is it true that you, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This morning, what I'd like to do is I want to share five things that I think we need to take away from this story that are going to help us navigate crucial conversations. And I have chosen my title, The Heat is On, obviously because of the heat of the fiery furnace that we learned about when we were in Sunday school as children. The first thing I want you to understand is there are going to be times when you are going to stand before people who have a combination of both power and emotion. Power and emotion. When the king found out that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow and worship, what was his response? He flipped out. Okay? He flipped out. When's the last time you saw somebody flip out? We don't, we don't see it in everyday life all that much as we get older, okay? Because we, most of us have pretty good control of our emotions, but the king, he flipped out. He was, he was literally furious with rage, he flipped out. He was so upset. And he said, I want, I want you to bring me these guys. Bring me these guys that you just told me about because I'm going to set them straight. Okay? That's, that's, it's always interesting how someone thinks that, some, that they're going to be able to set somebody straight. Okay? But that's what he said. He, he's, I'm going to be able to set them straight. And so he asks them, is it true? that you do not serve my gods? Is it, is it true that you did not bow down and worship the image of gold that I created? But I want you to notice, okay, we go from the question mark of that question 
and we move from there right into a statement he doesn't even give them time to answer. He is so, he is, he is moving on to the next thing. We've already established, he's, it's a rhetorical question. Obviously, they hadn't bowed. Obviously, they weren't worshiping. He is, it's a rhetorical question. He moves right into his statement, and he begins to say to them, Hey, maybe you didn't hear it right. Maybe you weren't. Maybe they really didn't realize what was going to happen to you. The king, he makes sure that there's, there's no misunderstanding of the command that was given. He makes sure that they understand that, th- that their disobedience is under the threat of death. If you don't bow and you don't worship, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, in our conversations, there may be times when we encounter a conversation with someone who in some way, shape, or form, whether it is, it is uh, structural, whether it is, it is literal, whether it's relational, but they are a superior in our lives. We, we, have, we have someone that not only are they superior, but they, there is something that has brought about an incredible amount of emotion in their life. Maybe they have the, the power to hire and fire. Maybe somehow they have, they have some financial um, superiority to you or something over you maybe relationally they are somehow over you uh, but they are in some way your superior and and they are they, they, they are upset they are mad they are they they somebody has done something and they are looking to blame someone and they are going to get their pound of flesh the question is how do we, in those crucial conversations, how do we respond? Now, they may not be the most powerful person in the world like Nebuchadnezzar. They, they may or may not be a supervisor. It might be a friend. It could be a family member. But somehow they have some sort of influence, some sort of, and we would have to say, some sort of power in your life. In Proverbs chapter 20, and verse 2, says a king's wrath strikes terror like the roar of a lion whose anger who those who anger him forfeit their lives our temptation when we face someone that that is roaring at us like a lion and and we have this conversation with them what is our immediate response if they they are we feel that this is completely unjust and they are coming at us roaring like a lion what is our response we want to raise up to their level, don't we? We want to get up to their level, and, and we want to, maybe even, if you really think about it, maybe we want to notch it up just a smidge above theirs. We want to get up, the, and we want to show them, hey, you might be uh, the person in charge here, but nobody has the right to treat me this way. And so we, we just, we, we stiffen our back and we raise up and we're going to come back and we're going to roar ourselves. The problem with that is this. When we do that, what do they do? They take it up the next notch. They take it up the next level. Why? Because they've, they're, they're already full of emotion. They already feel that they have superiority. And, and now you're daring to challenge their authority, and they're going to take it up a notch from there. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 gives us the completely different direction on how to handle that when it says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, I was thinking about this, that, that Jesus, when he came and he began to preach the gospel, he began to preach a gospel that was so different to them. He even said, you know what? If someone strikes you in the face, turn to them the other cheek. 
when we think of our rights, when we think of how we need to be treated, and someone comes at us with all the fury, with all the anger, with all the superiority in the world, we want to stand up and, 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 and we want to rise up and we want to meet that challenge. But Jesus said, you know what, you need to treat it treated a little differently. Paul said that, that when people mistreat us, we need to pray for them. We need to literally handle it different than the world does. And when we find ourselves in a crucial conversation with someone who, for whatever reason, has all the power and is filled with emotion, how we respond will make the difference in that relationship and in that circumstance between success and failure. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not rise up to meet the king's level. And there's a reason. That's number two. They understood who's really in control. After the king finished with his inquiry and his threats, he plays one last card. He said, when I'm going to get done with you, there is going to be no God who is able to rescue you. Not realizing what it meant to be a Hebrew, not realizing that God had set them free from Pharaoh in Egypt, not realizing how God had done so many great things in, their, in, in that nation's history, they knew something that Nebuchadnezzar did not know I wonder if they maybe looked at each other almost, not not with a smirk in their face, but maybe a little bit of a smile. But Nebuchadnezzar is placing himself in the position of highest authority above God. He thought he was in control of the conversation because he had what he thought was all the power. And I want you to know, no matter what side of the crucial conversation that you're on, we need to realize that God is in control. Maybe you're having a conversation and you are the one that is perceived uh, to have the, 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 the upper hand or the superiority in a conversation. We need to understand that God is in control. We may be the one who we realize is not uh, have the upper hand. We need to realize that ultimately God is in control. God tells Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9 that he raised him up in order to demonstrate his power. God literally raised Pharaoh up so that he could demonstrate his power in Egypt with those ten plagues that we read about in the book of Exodus. That God raised up Pharaoh so that he could show his glory. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. But let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. This is Paul writing, For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Man, that, you know, if if I apply that verse to my American history, it gets a little fuzzy, okay? It gets a little fuzzy, but yet that is what Paul says, that the authorities that are in place have been placed there ultimately by God. So as a subordinate, when we find ourselves facing someone who feels they have ultimate control, we need to be assured that God alone is in control. Let me tell you what Jesus said in John chapter 19, verse 11. He's talking to Pilate. He said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Okay? Jesus is acknowledging that all the authority comes from God and that God has given Pilate authority in this moment to sit over Jesus' trial. Authority comes from God. But what does the Bible say about how Jesus handled that? Jesus doesn't do one of these. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, no, you didn't. He doesn't, he doesn't say, Pilate, what do you think you're doing? I am the Prince of Peace. I am the King of Kings. You don't understand who I am. How dare you talk to me like that? In fact, the scripture says, like a sheep before the shearer, he was silent. 
How is that possible? There are times when we might be in a, in a crucial conversation and we want to, man, we want to just, we want to set them straight, right? I, I'm the only one that that's ever happened to, right? <laughs> Thank you for your laughter. I consider that a confession from everyone. How could Jesus do that? Number three, he realized we don't have to be defensive. We don't have to be defensive. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they finally speak to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's finally quiet. Okay, he gives them an opportunity to actually respond. And they say to him, Respectfully, King, we don't have to defend ourselves in this matter. Wow. They have been just told that they are going to die if they don't worship the Lord. What would your response or my response be? I, I'll tell you what my response be would be. I would be quoting from the law of Moses I would be quoting from the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I would say, King, uh, don't blame it on me. <laughs> I'm just doing what God told Moses. You know, I'm, that's all we're doing here. Hey, no offense. They didn't, it, we, we don't have to defend ourselves. That's, that's amazing to me. The calmness, the soft-spoken, quiet confidence very matter-of-factly. There was no confusion. They had heard the king's uh, orders. They were aware of the consequences. They knew that they stood on firm ground according to the law, according to the Ten Commandments. They knew that they were to put no other gods before. Of course, king, we, we, we wouldn't worship. But they didn't even say that. They didn't even tell, give the king any understanding about why. King, you invaded our country. I mean, come on. You brought us here because we're the best and brightest. But you brought us from a place where we worship the one true God. And we can't do that. They didn't even defend themselves. When we find ourselves in a crucial conversation, we often feel that we need to defend us. Are you with me? Someone is attacking us. Someone is speaking ill of us. They're confronting us <clears throat> about something. We need to defend ourselves. It's our natural response. In fact, it is our default button. Okay? We're going to defend ourselves. It is human nature, and, and I don't know about other cultures, I just know about us, okay? And here in this country, it is human nature. When someone attacks us, we defend ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that we need to allow ourselves to be a doormat for those who are around us. I'm not saying that if someone is abusing you, that you need to let that happen, okay? I am not saying that. But when someone who has power and authority and is full of rage and they descend upon you, you don't have to defend yourself before them. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What if this person in this crucial conversation, what if it's a family member? Have you ever had a, 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 a blowout with a family member before? Whew. Whew. I've told you about one that I had. I, it was, I don't know, it was six or eight years ago with my closest friend and in in, in just somebody that I, I trust absolutely. It was my brother Dan. <clears throat> I mean, it was a blowout of, I remember now, okay, I, I'm 55 right now, so however, I, uh, however old I was then. But I, I'm a grown man. I'm, I'm literally, I am bawling, okay, because of this conversation. 
We can have those crucial conversations when our response is going to mean everything. Maybe it's with a friend. Maybe it's with a coworker. Maybe it's with a boss. Maybe it's with someone in the church, but it's a crucial conversation. And our, our key default mechanism is that we need to defend ourselves. But Peter said, submit yourselves in, in, in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, uh, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, whether it's, whether it's a government thing or whether it's a, a family relational thing, that God calls us to submit ourselves to each other. Now, that person needs to do the same, but we're not responsible for them. We don't have to defend ourselves but we do need to make sure that we're standing firm on God's word, the ground of God's word. Number four, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego realized that God was able to deliver them. They weren't just making a general statement, oh, hey, don't worry, God's able to deliver us. They were saying, even if you throw us into the fiery furnace, God is able to deliver us. They're displaying ultimate confidence in God's ability to deliver. It's incredible. It's not the, it's not the only time in Scripture that that happened. I, I, just, I love the life of David, 1 Samuel 17. Uh, Goliath is shouting insults to the people of Israel, and uh, David volunteers to go fight uh, the lion, and King Saul says, David, you can't do this. You're too small. You're too young. And David said, hey, listen, I have experience in this stuff because when the lion and the bear came, they came to attack the sheep. I, I fought them and I killed them. I, I have experience in doing this. 1 Samuel 17, 37, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. David was not afraid to stand before the giant because he had experience with God's deliverance. It's one thing, though, to say it. It's another thing to successfully live it out. David didn't say, I've waited for this moment my whole life where I could test God to see if he could deliver me. David said, God has delivered me on numerous occasions before. We need to understand that God ultimately can deliver us. It's not easy to put ourselves in God's hands when someone is attacking our character. Psalm 18, verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So regardless of how difficult our crucial situation, our crucial conversation may be, God is able to deliver us. And you may feel like you are standing in front of someone who is literally roaring like a lion, and if I had hair on my head, it would be going backwards. That the shout is so loud. Maybe, man, you're so close you can feel the heat of their breath. Maybe they, they're even spitting on you accidentally because they are so upset. God is able to deliver you. Even if you are going through an assassination of your character, God can deliver you. And number five, simply this, no matter what. That's what they said, no matter what. What does that mean for them? Even if God doesn't deliver us, we won't bow, we won't worship. Even if God does not deliver us, we still will not worship your image. These guys knew that the king wasn't joking. It wasn't something that was funny. And by the very definition of a crucial conversation, it is something that is a tough issue. It's not easy. It's not laughable. It is not funny. It is very serious. And they knew that no matter what, no matter what was going to happen, whether this conversation goes well, whether it goes terrible, I know that God can deliver me. Now, I can tell you that King Nebuchadnezzar 
did not respond favorably. Okay, he did not all of a sudden, because of their humility and their respectfulness, he didn't say, wow, you guys are amazing. I just, I, I'm just overwhelmed with love for you guys. Forget about this. When, when we have that crucial conversation and they're, they're, they're roaring like a lion at us and they're all emotional and upset and furious and we respond with respect and we respond with calm and confidence and, and even a, a, a sense of just security in God, that doesn't mean they're going to turn around and say, wow, that was amazing. The Holy Spirit is working through you and I'm just automatically going to change my attitude. It doesn't happen that way. And it didn't happen that way for them. It didn't happen that way. His attitude changed. He was furious. He heated the furnace seven times hotter. He gives the order to throw them in. It's so hot that the soldiers that throw them in are killed because of the heat of the fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar is shocked when he looks into the fire and he doesn't see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there screaming. He sees them standing there. In fact, they're no longer tied and there's not three of them. There is now a fourth and the fourth looks like the Son of God. He is able to deliver you no matter what. They could not have dreamt this up if they tried. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that no matter what, they would not bow and worship the image. But they didn't know how God was going to set them free. They just knew he was. He was going to deliver them somehow. And even if your crucial conversation goes south, God still has the ability to deliver you. He still has the ability to set you free. Looks like the king is serious. They could have thought it was time to cave, but they didn't. They stood firm no matter what. So as we move forward in our lives, we face those crucial conversations. We might stand before people who have a lot of power, whether it's a, a formal power or an informal relational power, but combined with that power is an emotion that is just off the chain. We don't have to, to, to worry because we need to remember that, that God is in control. We need to resist the temptation to become defensive because God is able to deliver us no matter what happens, no matter which way this conversation goes. God can deliver us. In the midst of the fire, He'll be with us. Paul says this in Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 6, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I want you to stand with me. Would you do that, whether you're out in the hub or here in the sanctuary? Father, we, we come to you today, and Lord, we pray Lord, that as we, and, and, and for some here, they're already thinking of conversations that, that they have been involved in, and, and maybe they're already thinking about how they did in that. But Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be here right now in this moment. There might be some people here, you've got some crucial conversations that are, that are coming down the pike. They are coming and you know they're going to come and you're worried because you know that it may not be good because you might be dealing with somebody that's coming with a, from a position of power and there's emotion and it, they seem uncontrollable and you know you're going to have to stand there in that moment. Father, I pray, Lord, that that as we, we look at those situations, may our conversation be full of grace. May it be seasoned with salt. Your word says we are the salt of the earth. 
Father, I pray that through the Holy Spirit that we will know how to answer. Father, that we will not be defensive. Father, that we can be calm and cool and collected. That we can have our wits about us. Because, Father, we know that you are in control. I'm going to have the worship team lead us. And I just want to give you this moment to sort of meditate and say, God, what conversations am I involved in? What, what is out there that I'm looking forward to? How am I responding in those conversations, those crucial conversations? God, I pray that I would understand Father, that no matter how hot the fire is, you are the God who delivers. If that's, if you, if you know, if you're struggling, maybe there's a conversation that you're in right now. Maybe there's a conversation on the horizon. Maybe there was one that happened just shortly ago, and you say, man, the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart right now. Pastor, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up if that's you. Say, man, yes, yes. Come on, don't be, don't worry about, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, a couple more. Father, you see these hands all over this place. Father, there are conversations, Lord, that you want to empower us in. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit right now will begin to drive that point home with us. Come on, let's just worship the Lord together. Thank you for watching the message today. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, or if you have questions about your personal walk with Jesus Christ, we'd love to help answer those questions. We've prepared something specifically for you. It's a five-day devotional called Walk by Faith. We'd love to give you this as our gift to you today. Please contact us using the information provided for you on the screen. May God bless you.